this video I'd like to talk about this device, which is something I designed about two years ago with the aim of actually launching this on Kickstarter. So I'd like to just guide you through the design process, my thoughts of why I wanted to make this product, what this product is, and we'll go through the electronics and a bit of the firmware. So as you can see, this is quite a fairly sizable board with a processor on it. This is an SCM32H7 processor, some amount of RAM. This IC is actually a codec, so it contains ADCs and DACs, and this is an audio codec specifically. So it's up to 24 bits, quite a high sampling rate. And this is fed by various analog inputs and analog outputs. I have a various digital section over here for programming, power, and connectivity. A display up here and some various rotary encoders, which double as switches as well, and a power switch. As you can probably guess, this whole board and from the and from the previous few videos of the channel, this is an audio processing product. From previous videos on my channel, you've seen this guitar DSP, which is a guitar-based effects processor. This is a studio-based effects processor. So it actually has balanced line inputs and balanced line outputs, meaning we have fully differential inputs and outputs. And here's the rear panel. So we have XLR inputs, which double also as jack inputs in case you want to put an instrument input in. And we have XLR balanced outputs, DC power supply, connectivity, which I can then foot control, for example. And this is not Ethernet, as we'll see later, and USB. I also have little switches underneath, and this was just my first debug or test iteration where I can switch the function of this USB. So I can either use this USB for data streaming or programming. The front panel, on the other hand, very crude as well. I just use one of these cheap I2C displays, 3D printed buttons for the control and volume knobs, and these are rotary encoders with push buttons. And I have a power switch, which then lights up as well. I'll also be showing you in future videos how to program this device and what kind of effects you can run on it. And this is very similar to this guitar DSP board, except this time we have a slightly higher quality of circuitry, we have relays for true bypass switching. So I'd really like to just go through the, my ideas and the product design and why I thought this was needed, this product, and why I thought it'd be quite a cool idea to try and design something of this from scratch. Thank you very much to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. All these Infinia effects and guitar DSP boards you saw were produced, manufactured, and assembled by them. I also had the front and rear panels assembled by them, and these days they also offer aluminium PCBs, so you can make front and rear panels even more easily. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to try out Altium Designer for yourself, they're offering a free trial and 30% off if you do end up purchasing a license. You can go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab. I have various Altium Designer videos on my channel, one of them being this almost three hour long video giving you a complete walkthrough from project creation to getting your board manufactured and assembled by JLC PCB. I just like to take you through my essentially guitar DSP or Infinity Effects folder, the things I came up with, the media I produced, and the ideas I had for this product. And just looking back, it's quite interesting to see what I had in mind at the time. Effectively, I started off calling it guitar DSP, but then moved on to some sort of studio quality effects pedal or effects processing unit, which can stream data via USB and so on. It was supposed to include some sort of free studio quality effects library where I've written, you know, overdrives, reverbs, delays, compressors, and so on also with emulation, of course, all these marketing terms, you know, great hardware and so forth. And I wanted to keep the software open source as well. So anyone can write and share their plugins and their software. So I went through various iterations of this design. Here you can see the one we actually use in the guitar DSP videos. This is just the first iteration, very small form factor when this was still supposed to be a guitar processing platform. For that, then I also made a fairly nice case. So I airbrushed this or spray painted it and added these graphics to it. So I think that looked kind of neat after some photoshopping. And this would have been the guitar version then as well. I did then thought, okay, why restrict myself to guitar? Why don't I just make a whole studio effects processor? And this is the PCB we just went through and we just saw as well. Slightly less dusty this time. For this first version, I just essentially got a box, so a pre-made enclosure, and I designed the PCB to fit this. The front and rear panels, if we look, for example, over here, this is actually a PCB as well. So I just got the 3D models for all of the connectors, all of the switches and jacks and so on, and this screen, and then just made it in KiCad as well, these front and rear panels. So we can see the rear panel here, and also some venting, so we get a bit of heat release, so to speak. Here I've even found some old recordings. So this is the delay and I think overdrive setting.
So it doesn't actually sound too bad, the effects and the overdrive and delay. So I thought it was actually quite cool what you can do in software and digital signal processing. Let's go through section by section. First of all, just looking at the PCB itself, and then we'll jump over to KiCad to see the actual electronics or schematic layout. You can see this board is already quite dusty because I haven't had this out for quite a while. So this is a project I kind of finished and then dropped off because I had other plans. So you can really see the separation of these mixed signal boards. I have my power and part of my digital section kind of moved over here with enough clearance to this kind of sensitive analog section. So I have my power supply input, I have some protection, reverse polarity, and I have my main 3.3 volt buck converter. Here, yeah, this is an Ethernet or RJ45 jack, but I'm actually using, I think it's RS485 or CAN, which then connects to my microcontroller. So I'm kind of abusing these RJ45 jacks. And this is something I can then use, for example, to connect to a foot pedal. On the left here is my USB connector, which has some ESD protection and a USB switch. So one branch of this switch, which is triggered by the little micro dip switch we saw earlier, goes directly to the MCU. But if you flip the switch and put this into the other position, this goes to a different microcontroller. And this actually functions, functions as a programming device, so similar to an ST-Link. So rather than having to use my ST-Link to plug in to this 10-pin header, I can just plug in USB and program directly. So this I thought was quite a neat little feature. Moving down further into the digital section, again, excuse the very, very dusty PCB. We have the main processor, with, which is this SM32H7 microcontroller. So very powerful, quite a lot of RAM and flash. I have various debug LEDs, which is not seen by the end user because they're, of course, protected by this enclosure. But I have an extra bit of RAM, main processor, an optional SPI head I can connect, and this main audio codec, which is a quite advanced uh, analog devices codec. You can see I've also added these jumpers in because I was in a debug stage where I wasn't entirely sure and I wanted to keep options open, for example, which clock sources I use and so forth. Going a bit further down, I also have a debug header in case this programming solution didn't work with USB, and I have some QSPI flash memory. So I have enough storage for audio processing, I have a pretty powerful microcontroller which acts as my DSP, and I also have this display connector where I very crudely connected up these connections to the display. That's because I didn't have the connector and stuff. So that pretty much sums up the digital section all over here. So it's fairly simple. You know, some sort of programming, sort of connectivity. And then I have this buck converter stage here, which feeds my digital section. Now the analog is a bit more involved and takes a bit more space and mainly because I wanted to keep the spacing. So one of the main principles in mixed signal design is keep proper spacing. So you have fairly good clearance between analog and digital sections, especially within this processor and this analog section over here. Let's go through the analog section just briefly before we look at the schematic. So the analog section consists of the line inputs and the line outputs. These orange blocks here are relays, so I can do true bypass switching from input to output. So I can either switch the signal path from the input through to the codec and then back to the output, or just feed them straight through. All these little ICs here are an E5532 op amps, also with biasing sections because I'm running this off a single supply rail with various anti-aliasing filters on the input stage and various reconstruction filters, so to speak, on the output stage. Pretty simple, just trying to get, you know, the 20 to 20 kilohertz range and everything else filtered out. And so I can feed these differential ADCs and DACs quite nicely from the circuitry. You can also see I have these various analog power supplies here. So I have my buck 3.3 digital power supply somewhere up here, but I have my analog power supplies up here. Perform some various filtering. You can see I have various large copper fills here for heat dissipation because in some cases I am stepping down the voltage quite a fair amount from the nominal 12 volt input voltage. So I have a main supply rail here and various bias supplies for the codec. I also have another regulator here which essentially is for the display. And then of course I have my power on power off button which essentially just toggles and enable up here on this power supply and on these power supplies and I have various rotary encoders which get routed to the timer channels of my SM32H7 microcontroller. So let's jump over to KiCad and then have a look at this in more detail. Here we are in KiCad looking at the InfiniFX schematic, so the schematic for the Studio Effects Processing System. And you can see there's quite a lot of pages to the schematic. Let me just see actually when that, that was done. That was, you know, mid-2020, probably before I started with this. So quite a bit ago. It'll also be interesting to see if I can spot any mistakes or, you know, how well the schematic is drawn. So we started with power and the first thing is I think I didn't draw the symbols myself at the time, which isn't great, you know, nowadays I would draw all the, all the symbols myself, even though 
pan out for this looks okay. I mean, I wouldn't draw a MOSFET in this, in this symbol as well. Sentry has some sort of fusing, reverse polarity protection, even though the gate really isn't protected, which isn't great. Also, these four bar nodes or four wire nodes aren't great either. This is some sort of soft start IC and current limiting IC. So I have a soft start capacitor and current limiting resistor in addition to this fuse. So it's quite heavily protected. And some sort of filtering, even though there's another capacitor missing. We have an analog linear supply, which steps down the input voltage through some quite heavy filtering to 9 volts via an LM317. We have a power switch, and again, the symbol isn't great, but this is the switch at the front of the PCB. And here we have main 3.3 volt buck converter, and also one for 5 volts. And you can see the way I've drawn this, this isn't ideal, we have these sections floating around, so this should be hooked up. So it's interesting to see as well what happens in two years, and how you maybe change your views on PCB design, and how a schematic should be drawn. And we have the various different analog supplies as well. So quite a lot of different supplies, and I'm sure we can get rid of some of these and still have similar noise performance, but it's interesting to see. Then we have the microcontroller section, which is this huge STM32H7 microcontroller. These decoupling capacitors should be connected straight up like this and not floating by themselves. Boot mode switch, HEC crystal, and everything kind of floating their own sections, which I don't really like to do anymore. And we have the SD RAM as well, and the quad SPI flash memory. So a pretty straightforward schematic so far. Here we have the relay section, which simply flicks between input routed to codec or input routed straight to out output. We also have the rotary encoders here, which require you know, certain pull-ups, and we have some filtering on them to avoid glitches and so forth. Here is the connector section. And so let's have a look through. We have the DC connector, which ideally should just be on the power supply page, serial wire debug, ICC display, SPI, and we have this USB connector, which switches between, you know, the debug MCU, which uh, so to speak is the ST-Link, and the SM32H7. So we have this USB switch over here, and this RJ45 connector, which actually turns out to be IS422, not CAN. And this was supposed to be used for remote communication. Here we have a rather huge analog input section. So this is differential and of course, doubled for both channels. So you'll see the same schematic sections twice, so to speak. What I'm doing is just some sort of buffering. So I have a known about 10, 11 kilo ohm input impedance. I'm doing some sort of filtering and I've used some filter designers to do this. And then I'm feeding this differential ADC. And these are pretty standard circuits and I immediately don't see if there's anything wrong with it. So this looks fairly sensible for now. So I have it for left and for right. Ah, uh, yes, some of these relays actually switch between differential to single-ended. For example, I might have these high impedance inputs, which I use the jacks instead of the XLR connectors. For example, if I want to plug in a guitar, which has a typically very high output impedance. And then we have these sort of bias generators because we're running off a single supply. Then we have the codec IC, which I basically just took most things from the data sheet of how to cook this up. I did include some jumpers because I wasn't sure if I want to use, for example, the crystal or get timing, for example, from the STM32H7 microcontroller. So I gave myself some options in this debug or prototyping stage of this PCB. The analog output, again, is left and right. And this time we don't have some sort of single-ended conversion. These are essentially just buffers, reconstruction filters, and then we feed the output with a known fairly low impedance, so 220 ohms. And again, I don't like how I did this two years ago, but these are the audio connectors. So the mixed XLR and tip rinse sleeve or TRS connectors and the XLR output connectors. So these should be on their respective pages of analog in and analog output. Finally, we have the debug section, which is just an SN32 F1 microcontroller, which emulates an ST-Link. So there might be a lot of pages to the schematic, but actually it's fairly simple. So let's have a look at the PCB side of things and see if we can spot something that isn't that great. First of all, let's look at the 3D view. The first thing I noticed, we looks like we have all 3D models, which is something I always recommend. So that's a pretty good start. And so this is what I then used, of course, to fit the front panels and then fit this into the case. The first thing, of course, is the separation. We have the analog section somewhat over here, digital all around here with parts over here as well. So the main thing with mixed signal design and something I knew also two years ago was to maintain proper spacing if you want to minimize crosstalk, noise and so forth. So layout wise, it's pretty straightforward. The usual rules apply. Decoupling capacitors close as possible to the ICs themselves. Crystal section nicely spaced from other sections because this is fairly sensitive. I don't like the via placement, for example, of this. I think the vias are too close to the pads and this can cause problems with soldering. Other than that, I don't think I did any sort of length matching or time matching for this SDRAM chip. And I don't think I actually tested the SDRAM chip, so I'm not I'm rather uncertain if that'll actually work. Buck converter layout probably could be made tighter as well, but it's I guess it's guess it's okay. 
and the layout seems fairly neat, fairly tight. This is a four layer board, by the way. So this seems fairly reasonable. I tried to keep the analog sections fairly tight as well. The way I've second to this PCB, at the time, I believe this first inner layer is a ground plane and the second inner layer is actually a power plane. And this is something I would do differently these days. I would do two ground planes as the inner layers because this maintains a better reference. And please see my recent PCB stack up and build up video for reasons why. And here, unfortunately, because we have splits in the reference, depending on what the reference then is. So here we have the digital 3.3 volts. We have nine volts for the analog side. You have the issue that you might be routing across splits. And this is horrible for EMI and EMC. So I would recommend not doing this, but rather having two dedicated ground planes and then routing power. For the routing itself, I could increase the spacing. For the digital traces, it's kind of okay. But yeah, as you can see, there's very, very tight spacing here, which isn't great. So of course you should maximize the spacing you have. But it was interesting to dig up this old project and see what I had in mind for some sort of crowd-funded project. And it's also interesting to see two years on what skills you've acquired, hopefully in the positive sense. Lastly, let me just show you how I did the PCB front and rear panels. So I made another KiCad project and just opened the PCB editor. And from my 3D models, I could then pretty accurately determine where my holes need to be placed, also for screw holes and so forth. So I made two separate PCB outlines, then exported them, for example, like this one by one, so I have my front and I have my rear panels. So fairly straightforward. Once you have 3D models, once you have proper dimensions of your case to make these PCB panels, and then I simply at the time used JLC PCB just to make me a two layer board with these certain cutouts. So really inexpensive. These days, JLC PCB make aluminum PCBs, which is probably a bad idea for, for making front panels with. You can see a uh, keycat can't really distinguish between the cutouts. So I had to do them, export them individually. Of course, then you can also choose black, green, blue, red solder masks. So you can make your front panels look a bit funky as well. So I hope you enjoyed this brief look at a basic prototype or product design and what kind of ideas go into it, how to maybe come up with your own little mix signal prototype product, what sections you need to look at, and how maybe you can improve things in your own design. So thank you very much for watching. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel. And if you haven't seen the videos previously, I have various videos on digital audio processing using the smaller of these guitar DSP boards to write your own digital audio effects.